Welcome to the organic chemistry section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 111 to 115. So first, I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 111, 112, 113, 114, and 115. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 111, it says an alcohol that is placed in concentrated acid and heat is converted into which products? So we have an alcohol, we put it into concentrated acid and heat. Which products do we get? So essentially, what happened is, for example, if we have this alcohol, we put it into concentrated acid, so the oxygen got protonated, we now have OH2+, plus, or water, which is a good leaving group, whereas the OH was not a good leaving group. And we have some heat giving energy to the reaction, also driving away the water that is formed. And so now the water is going to leave. There are two ways it can leave. It can leave first, and then we have a carbocation. But then another way that it can leave is if something comes along. And this isn't a, it doesn't necessarily have to be a base. It could be other water molecules floating out in solution, but something comes along, takes the hydrogen, the electrons from that come over here into this bond. There are too many bonds now on the carbon on the right, and so our leaving group leaves. What do we have? We have an alkene, which looks like this. Our leaving group left, so the other product is water. So we get an alkene, that's the double bonded one, and water. And the other ones are incorrect. C and D don't even contain a water, so that's incorrect. And A is saying an alkyne, meaning a triple bonded one, so that's incorrect. So it's a double bonded molecule that we get. In question 112, we're asked which of the following intermolecular forces contributes to the boiling point of the shown molecule. So we have some intermolecular forces contributing to the boiling point. So which ones do, the rest do not. So boiling point is mainly dependent on intermolecular forces. Once again, that's forces between different molecules, not within the same molecule. So if we had a solution with a bunch of this molecule as shown, what forces do we have? Dipole, dipole, do we have that? Yes, we do. Because if we look at this carbonyl part, sorry that the image is so blurry, but if we look at the carbonyl, there is a dipole because the oxygen is more electronegative than the carbon, and this creates delta negative charge on the oxygen, delta positive charge on the carbon, and then these dipole-dipole interactions are going to happen between different molecules. That's intermolecular forces, higher boiling point. Option two, London dispersion forces, also known as van der Waals forces. These occur pretty much between all molecules, and so this is something which will always show up. So yes, this is present. Option three is saying ionic bonds, and that's not something which is present. That occurs when there's a formal charge, when there's actually a negative or a positive charge, and this molecule is not charged. So there's no ionic bonding going on here, so option three is incorrect. And option four is also incorrect. There's no hydrogen bonding going on here, because if we had, like this oxygen can participate in hydrogen bonds, however, there is no electro or hydrogen bond donor on this molecule. So if we're just talking about a solution of this molecule, then there are no hydrogen bonds taking place. There's no hydrogen bond donor, although there is an acceptor. So there isn't hydrogen bonding going on, and that's not playing a part in the boiling point. So it's only options one and two, so A is our correct answer. In question 113, we're asked what difference would be expected between 1-butanol and 1-2-butane diol. So what difference do we expect between 1-butanol and 1-2-butane diol? And essentially, all, that, all they are is four carbon chains, so 1, 2, 3, 4. The first one has an OH over here. The second one looks like this. And there's a second OH at carbon 2. So a single alcohol versus a diol. The main thing is the second OH. Now we have something that's making it more polar, and then we have more hydrogen bonds taking place. So if there's more hydrogen bonds, 
that means that the boiling point is going to be higher. So that's something that we can expect to be different. Option A is saying that the second one, 1,2-butane diol, would have higher volatility. That's incorrect. It would actually have lower volatility. If we have more OHs, that's more hydrogen bonds, and therefore a higher boiling point, which means it's harder to get these molecules to go from the, the liquid phase to the gas phase. And if something is volatile, that means that it easily goes from liquid to gas. So therefore, the volatility is lower. And it's the opposite of what we affect, so A is, A is incorrect. B is saying it would have a lower molecular weight. That also doesn't make sense. It wouldn't be lower, it would be higher. If we add this other OH group, that added molecular weight that's coming from the OH is going to add to the overall weight of the molecule. So it's a higher molecular weight. Option C is saying the dial would have a higher boiling point, And this is finally something which is correct. And finally, option D is saying there'd be lower solubility in water. That's incorrect. If you have more OH groups, you have a more polar molecule. Water is a polar solvent. And in terms of solubility, like dissolves in like. So the dial would have higher solubility in water, not lower. In question 114, it says hydrogenation reactions are usually also reduction reactions, whereas protonation ones are not. The primary reason for this is blank. So hydrogenation reactions, they're also reduction. Protonation ones are not. What's the primary reason for this? In a hydrogenation reaction, we're adding hydrogens, but then we're also doing that in protonation. But the main difference is what is going on along with those hydrogens? What state are those hydrogens in? When we have hydrogenation, we could add H2, for example, or let's just say that we're adding a hydride. If we're just adding one hydrogen, what we're adding is an H minus, meaning we are adding a hydrogen with two electrons. Whereas when protonation is happening, we have an H plus, which means that there's a proton being added, but not electrons. Or just one electron instead of two. And so what's going on in this case is the difference in electrons. The hydride is a nucleophile which is being directed towards some other molecule, whereas the H plus is an electrophile and it's something that other nucleophiles will attach onto. And that's the main difference. So let's look at the answer options. Option A is saying protonation occurs, only occurs with nitrogen and oxygen atoms. That's incorrect. It can also occur with other atoms such as sulfur, for example, but that's not the reason that's the difference between hydrogenation being reduction, whereas protonation not being reduction. And yeah, what we're mainly talking about is reduction. Reductions, you can think about it, right, as the gain of electrons. Oil rig, oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is gain of electrons. There are more electrons being gained when we have the hydride. Option B is saying hydrogenation does not affect the oxidation state, while well, protonation does. Once again, an incorrect statement, although this one is relevant to reduction. But yeah, hydrogenation does affect the oxidation state, but protonation can as well. For example, if we had something that was like Cl minus, now we add protons, now it's HCl, the oxidation state has changed. Option C is talking about, or there, there are many other examples where the oxidation state can change based on addition of protons. Protons, in option C it says, protons do not come with electrons, while hydrogen atoms in hydrogenation do come with electrons. And so C is correct. We're talking about those extra electrons that are being added. Let me just have an example. If we had some acid and an H, and then we had a base. Yes, actually, one quick amendment. There isn't an electron here. Yeah. With a hydride, there are two electrons. That's why it's negatively charged. And with the proton, the H+, plus, there aren't electrons. Because if we just take this example, there's a base. You can notice every bond has two electrons, right? You can notice that the two, we can draw it out like this. The two electrons here, the lone pair that's attacking from the base, that's two electrons. It's taking the hydrogen. And then this bond goes back towards the acid. And what we end up getting is an acid 
which now has both of those electrons, which is why it's negatively charged, plus the base, and then we have that new bond that's formed, and it has the hydrogen, we can call this positively charged, but both of those electrons in the bond came from the base. So in protonation, electrons are not transferred. So option C is correct. Protons do not come with electrons, while hydrogen atoms and hydrogenation do. That's why we're calling those reduction reactions, and protonation reactions are not reduction reactions. Option D is saying protons are too small to reduce compounds. No. In both cases, we have hydrogens, right? In protons versus um, hydrogenation, and the hydrogen can reduce compounds. It's about the transfer of electrons, so option D doesn't really make sense. It's not really correct. In question 115, we're asked how many distinct stereoisomers exist for the following compound. Distinct stereoisomers. So how many unique stereoisomers are there? Well, if you look at this compound, you should be able to read from the chemical formula that there are one, two, three, four main carbons in the chain, and then those other ones over here, those are part of a functional group, or part of the side chain. So one, two, three, four. In the second one, we have a fluoride, same as well in the third one, and then in the last one, those are the side chain ones, they look like that. So, we can see what's not being shown here are, are hydrogens. So we can see that some are chiral and some are not. For it to be chiral, there should not be a plane of symmetry. And we can normally look at carbons and say if we have four unique things bonded, then we have a chiral center. For example, over here, we have three hydrogens. Because of that, this carbon is not chiral. Same reason that these carbons are not chiral. And then this carbon over here is not chiral because it has those two methyl groups attached. That's two of the same group, not four unique ones. Therefore, it's not chiral. And then the two in the middle are chiral. So we have hydrogen here, hydrogen here. Those remaining carbons with the fluoride, they're both chiral. And if we have two chiral centers, you just have to do 2n is our formula. So that's 2 squared n being the number of chiral centers which equals to 4 and if you want to just quickly see them both of those chiral centers could be r for example they could both be s one could be r, r while the other is s and then the inverse can happen the first one can be s while the other one is r so there are four types that we can have so b is our correct answer that's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is right here, as well as in the description below. And in that course, we go through a lot more questions, just like we did right now, going through all the different answer explanations and you know going through why each one's correct or incorrect so you get the right type of thinking for the MCAT. Other than that, make sure to subscribe here to this channel to stay up to date with the videos posted. And that's it for this video. I'll see you guys.